The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama. The Galleon Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year the best pharmaceutical product, the best biotechnology product, the best medical technology, and the best digital health product. This is the right event on the right issue at the right time. I thank His Excellency, the President, for bringing Prix Galleon to Africa and I look forward to the day when we will celebrate an African winner of the Prix Galleon. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The Pre Galleon Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Galleon Foundation. And now, welcome to the Galleon Digital Health Webinar Series. Welcome everyone, I'm Gil Bash. It is a, an honor and a privilege to be with you today and to host this panel of global experts on data governance. I first wanna start out and just acknowledge the Secretary General of the Galleon Foundation, who is with us today, Bruno Cohen. Uh, Bruno is an advocate for innovation around the world, whether it be in the life sciences or digital technologies or medical devices or policy. It is through Bruno Cohen that, that all of these magnificent people today in our panel, and also, as you've just seen in that brief video, come together every year to celebrate innovation that can improve the human condition. What is data governance? It's a very complex and yet very essential topic. It deals with the essence of the future of health innovation, of health care. It really is the foundation of decision-making. It's an approach to managing information that enables all the members of the health ecosystem to consider multiple needs of multiple audiences, the needs of the patient, payers, product innovators, policymakers, and providers. But ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, how do we source, secure, and share information? Information that includes people's health lives, financial data, directions, treatments, and even the future of biomedical innovation. And we have uh, five really exceptional people and I'm just going to start in alphabetical order. Uh, first of all, we have with us Jamie Edwards. He's the CEO of CloudBreak. Uh, Jamie, by the way, is a dear, dear, there he is. Obviously he is a guitarist or collects guitars. We'll have to find out at some point during the panel, which one is it? Uh, but he's wearing a very cool shirt that Dr. Kalali pointed out is chalk filled with zippers. Or as Jamie said, it is the Swiss army knife. Of, of, uh, of dress shirts. Now, Jamie, aside from being CEO of CloudBreak, was CEO of the Emergent Medical Associates. He remains there as a board member. He's been a multiple time Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of, of the Year Award recipient. Uh, he's a great healthcare change agent. He's a Twitter friend. We follow each other. I encourage you, by the way, to follow all the people um, who are here today on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, I'm sure that they welcome, they welcome the interaction. We have Jessica Federer. Jessica is really an exceptional um, executive of our industry. She's a board member of companies. She's an investor. She is the US Managing Director of Yuma. It's a global health technology company that's really at the forefront of advancing care. And she's also part of the venture affiliate partner for the Boston Millennial Partners. Now, Jessica has been named probably more than once to influential lists 
but she is a hundred global chief digital officer. She is a, I'm gonna say a power person, although the award was power lady. I, I think that you really are one of the great ones of our industry, period. Um, she really is a digital health transformation agent. She was the chief digital officer of Bear, which obviously is a colossus in the life sciences. And also Jessica is another great Twitter friend. Follow her on Twitter if you wanna get smarter about all things digital health. Uh, Michelle Hoseth is the chief data officer of Parkcell. Now you should be familiar with Parkcell. It probably is one of the largest contract research organizations in the world. Um, her position is a global position. It is a position that puts her in touch with pretty much every single major life science company in the world, certainly all the largest biopharmaceutical companies in the world. There probably isn't a clinical area that Michelle is not touching or having to consider with data management. She um, also is working with uh, colleagues around the world to really explore this concept of real world data clinical research. Michelle knows data governance. She's humble also, but I just wanted to give you a bit of her background. Dr. Emil Kalali is, um, he's, he's more than a physician scientist. He really uh, defines Renaissance person. Um, Amir probably has touched almost every single neurologic therapy in the United States. He was head of Quintile's um, a business area, the Neuroscience Center of Excellence at Quintas, which is now known as Acuvia. Um, he is the co-chair of the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance, which has drawn together more than 100 of um, companies in the world, biopharmaceutical companies, contract research organizations, government agencies, leading patient groups. He's at the forefront of that. Uh, Amir has a superpower and Amir's superpower is harnessing people's desire to work together. He is the founder and curator of CNS Summit. By the way, registration for CNS Summit 2021 just went online today. I will say, I'd like to believe I was the first one to register for the meeting, but um, he won't tell me. Uh, I hope I was. Uh, Amir, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, actually, I'm going to be uh, pressing Amir on two subject topics during the panel. One. Amir really is the voice of the patient and community. Um, and two, Amir also, because of his collaborative spirit, is very, very close to many of the regulatory decision makers on these topics. I'm, I'm hoping you'll speak to both of those. Last, I'd like to introduce Satika uh, uh, Mahmoud, um, who's a dentist by training. Um, she also has um, an incredible background. I do wanna share it with you because it really is representative of the depth of all of our panelists today. She's the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Health Catalyst Life Sciences. She is really key to that organization's vision around growth. She is looking at unmet patient needs across a multitude of therapeutic categories. She's an advisor to major health organizations around the world. She herself is a global policy influencer um, she is a dental surgeon. I'm curious, Michelle, or, uh, uh, Sadika, are you still uh, practicing or is that in your past? You'll have to cue us in during the conversation. We'll, we'll, I've got to know. She has a master's degree in public health from Harvard. Um, she is really my newest Twitter follower and I follow her closely as well. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question about the premise of this conversation, and I want to direct it to Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I gave a broad definition of data governance just a few moments ago. You live and breathe this. You're collecting data. You are sourcing data. You're seeking to secure data. And ultimately, with the, your clients and the government for registration, for review of therapies, you have to share data. Can you also define what is data governance from the point of view of the research community? So Gil, I think I'd like to go backwards actually from the from the patient to the data, right? So, um, you know, we're all here, this panel's all here because we wanna improve the well-being of people in our society and the way that they're cared for and the impact of therapies, whether that is in care provision, which we've got some representation here 
or in the development of therapies, which you've got some representation here. In order to get to that <clears throat> from the patient, we need knowledge, we need information, which is predicated on data. Data has become sort of the gold currency um, with which we're you know, trying to achieve our, our shared mission and improve the quality of life of people. Um, in order to be able to use the data though, um, we really need to look at policies, the standards through which uh, data are transformed, the technologies that create that interoperability, um, where data is stored, how it's processed, and therefore who has access to it. All of these things that um, need to be managed uh, in order to take data, create information and knowledge have to happen today in a much more um, harmonious or integrated way. And those, all of those components, whether they be technical, policy, policy ownership, um, you know, processing, they're all the ingredients of uh, a complete uh, approach to data governance. It's the way that we govern data to use yeah. it. To you know, Michelle, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, that, that's a great sort of setting the framework for the conversation. I, I wanna bring Sadika into this as well. You know, Sadika is sitting on 70 million uh, patient records. Sadika, is that correct? 70 million plus, yes. 70 million plus. I'm sorry, this is, this is a little bit like the, the, um, the, the famous fast food, a billion served. You're, you're, you're gonna get there, I'm positive of that. You know, we're just listening to Michelle. She laid out this concept of, of, of data, data are, are gold, right? It's like the new Bitcoin data, particularly um, about this. I, I'd like to get your perspective on this because you're sitting on these records uh, with, without breaching any proprietary information or confidentiality, could you share a little bit of why these data sets, these 70 million patient records are in fact gold and also set a tone for what we talked about before, the privacy of people's data? Absolutely. Thank you, Gil. I think the, the pandemic really has taught us that without data, we are flying blind in healthcare, right? Um, we need a 360 view to build what I like to call digital twin of the patient that informs our understanding of the patterns, not predictions, but patterns that can inform patient care, drug development, public health and policy. And we need data that is high quality and also available near real time from a variety of sources. That's really what would be considered gold currency when it comes to data. And going back to the topic of data governance, I have a philosophy around this that I would like to share. Please do. So data governance, I believe is a necessary habit to achieve governed information. And it is impossible to achieve it without passion for patients and patient care. So as a physician, as a patient and as a caregiver, I truly align with that philosophy. And now when I apply that to the records that we manage across a variety of health systems in our day-to-day -day work, really there are six things that become part of data governance and that also inform patient data privacy. One is we need to increase the data content. And I think pandemic has absolutely increased that. Digitization of healthcare has absolutely increased that data content. We need to enhance data quality while reducing the data collection burden, right? We can't just keep saying, let's add to the data to increase the quality. We have to put in some global data standards on common analytics use cases. We know what those are coming out of this pandemic. And we have to encourage more data access. And when I say data access, it's licensing data, but also interoperability, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And then we have to modernize data rights and patient privacy regulations that are out there. We've been sitting on HIPAA for a long time in the US. Time to think about that again. Oh, that's, HIPAA, HIPAA is a double-edged sword, isn't it? You know, it's, it, it, does it protect us or does it uh, serve as an obstacle today? That's a very interesting point. I want you to stay here. You're listing out these six things. I want you to hold on some of them. 
because there'll be conversation sparks as we go over. And I, I, I want to first turn to Dr. Kalali Amir and then to Jessica on this um, to, to sort of pivot what you and Michelle have shared. Uh, Amir, probably your work around the world is known. You know, for all of us who follow you on social media before the pandemic, we usually saw you in China or Singapore or someplace on the globe. And, and uh, Sadika said something that I think was pretty critical. I'd like to get your perspective on it. She talked about global standards. That was her first point, global standards. And I, I really, you're a globalist. I, I, I would love to get your reflection on, is it possible to have global standards of data governance? Are there some standards that exist already, some mindset or some behavior? What do you think? Thanks, Colina. You know, this morning before the, um, this webinar, I was actually thinking about this and I was thinking, you know, in the old days when I used to do 40 countries a year, if I got ill somewhere else, well, in the US, frankly, if you're in two health systems or two hospitals, it's extremely difficult to get those two local hospitals to talk to each other, let alone if you're in another country. So it's really interesting to me. I mean, standards are one thing, but we don't even have interoperability within the same neighborhood, let alone global. So that's a really interesting concept. They'll be very relevant to someone like me who might be in a different continent every week once things go back to normal. But also you said a couple of things I found interesting. Um, you started talking about gold. I know data has been also referred to erroneously as the new oil. Um, I hope that we kind of try and um, assuage people's fear that we're going to have a data industrial complex, you know? Uh, so I think what you meant by gold, I'm assuming knowing you was really, it's value to patients, improving outcomes, right? Dr. Scott, so, we've right. Got to, we've got to invent new cures. Right, so I mean, that's, that's the gold. I think I wanna, uh, clearly uh, private enterprise needs incentives to you know, have businesses around that. But I think certainly one of the th topics to think about is that really the, the critical aspects of ownership and all that. So I think there is a fear that there is a sort of data industrial complex whose only purpose is to hold the data and not share it, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's brilliantly said. By the way, Jeff Bezos will be joining us in just a few moments to talk about his use of data. No, he well, won't. But, 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 but you know, Gil, I mean, to that, I will tell you that if you talk to the leaders at AWS, they will tell you very clearly they have zero access to the Amazon data because one, you know, one can imagine lots of synergies there. But within the Amazon family, there's zero sharing of data between Amazon consumer and someone like AWS or their health group. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, taking from what you were just saying, Amir, and, and as I said, I wanted to call on Jessica for a reason. You know, Jessica has, um, in a way, been your counterpart in a major life science company. Now she's on the investment side. She's looking across uh, the, the spectrum of innovation. And, 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 and Jessica, I've, I've always sort of wondered, I've always been a, an early adopter of, of technology. Um, I was the, probably the first person out to buy the, the Apple Newton when it was available. Not that anybody knows what an Apple Newton is today. Maybe a mirror, maybe. But um, you know, here I am with my Apple Watch 6, my, my iPhone 12. I'm sharing data back and forth you know, between this. I'm sharing it with some specialist friends just because they're interested in, in, um, in new data health technology. You're in the forefront of this discipline in digital health. When you think of this and you think of data governance, What's keeping you up at night in terms of the, not the obstacles where our poll question was, my real question is, is the dealing with utilization and security uh, using new wearables and new digital health technologies? That's a wonderful question, Gil. You know, I think what keeps me up is that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And um, it's it's 2021. You know our health, our, our data, our data is already being used to tell us what uh, coupons we get in the mail, to tell us what TV shows we're going to watch, to suggest vacation locations to us. The data is being used for meaningful um, purposes to help people make decisions that that is in line with their preferences in other fields in healthcare because of misaligned incentives. 
because of different paces of growth or different paces of investment, um, there's been a highly fragmented system and there were incentives in place to enable silos to develop. And of course, we have people from 40 countries watching us today. It's also different in every country. Every country has a different level of where they're at with data governance. But if we step back for a second and we think about airplanes, you can fly to any country because all the airplanes have agreed to certain governance standards. It's a great point. You know, if, if you think of credit cards, you can use your credit card anywhere around the world because people have agreed to standards. And this topic of governance, while it may sound a little dull and boring, it's actually the sexiest topic in data because without governance, we're not able to have accessibility or interoperability or to get to what we really want to do, which is improve healthcare. So that my doctor's visit today makes your doctor's visit tomorrow better because we can learn from it in near real time because the data speaks the same language. And if we can do it with credit cards and if we can do it with airplanes, we really can do it for healthcare. Uh, you, you, you've laid out a very optimistic, hopeful point of view. And I think that this is one of the first times I've heard those analogies and they're welcome. Um, and I thank you for that. You know, just sort of flipping over to Jamie, you know, who actually is going to respond and um, actually play one of those guitars at the same time. And so that will be a Galleon Foundation first. Now we've never had entertainment at the foundation pre-Galleon dinner, but, but we've just booked with Jamie to do that. So we want to thank you, Jamie, in advance. But you know, Jamie, you're 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 kind of like at the rubber meets the road. In, um, in dealing with these issues in a very, very concrete way. And the, you know, I was asked yesterday about the question of, let's say telehealth. Uh, telehealth is, um, you know, uh, is actually um, been a, a boom sector because of COVID-19 and yet we see it plateauing. And a part of that is the economics obviously of how much doctors get reimbursed. Um, but I've also seen situations where a patient in state one can't access an expert in state two because of rules and regulations between the states. And, and some of that's for economic reasons, less for policy reasons. I, I'm wondering if you could reflect, you know, leading a, a national organization as you do, uh, when you think of data governance, what are the systems your organization has put in place to ensure that the conversations we have are guarded? Yeah, Gil, it's a great question. And one, that'll be my first musical booking in about 20 years. So uh, keep your keep your ears you covered. Get back into foundation. The, COVID has changed our lives, right? It's just changed our lives. Why not yours? Yeah, there you go. Um, well, Amir alluded to this before, um, but really at Cloudbreak, we've we struggle with what everyone else struggles with when it comes to data privacy and governance. There's a privacy versus convenience trade-off that we've been doing as consumers since the beginning of you know, the internet age. There's a privacy versus portability issue, which we've been dealing with. And when you think about that, you know, there's a woman on Twitter, Stacy Hurt, who is a- Great um, person. Yeah, she, uh, she cancer survivor. She, the other day, was talking about the fact that she needed to get her medical record, let alone state by state or country by country. Let's talk about getting your medical record from doctor to doctor. Um, and the challenges that she had and the fact that her doctor said, great, I'll give you a CD-ROM, you know, or we'll fax it over. Like our problems are not technology issues as it stands today from data, it is human behavior and it is policy that really drives it. And so, you know, when you take a look at the other types of trade-offs that are now we're looking at with privacy, it's privacy versus clinical outcomes, right? If we had more data and those data records were able to be more portable, would how does that translate into a better patient experience or potentially a better treatment. And now COVID showed us it's privacy versus public health. Um, so using that same structure, you know, you can see those trade-offs. And we at Cloudbreak, we do 130, 140,000 encounters a month at over 1900 healthcare systems across the country. And um, we have a lot of thought process we put into, how are we managing the data? In certain instances, we won't collect data so that we don't have to keep it on our servers. It all remains within the hospitals. EMRs from that structure. So we will offload that responsibility, if you will, to others and not have redundant data in places it shouldn't be. Um, but uh, it, it, when you take a look at the overall structure of what we're doing, it's about keeping data safe, but it's also like governance to us isn't just about cybersecurity. 
It's about what the actual intent of the data is. And one area where that's critical is de-identified data. The power mm -hmm. of the information that's in the platform, like for us, we're mainly focused on underserved communities with health disparities. If we, we've considered many times over unlocking that data so that we could help our communities. And we haven't done it yet because we haven't had that expertise in house to do it. We haven't layered AI over our call data or anything like that. But those are all the opportunities that are in front of us. Um, but right now it's, it's all about how you secure that data and then the intention, the actual intention of what you wanna use it for and making sure you're respecting the data. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask, uh, I'm going to ask, pivot from what you've just said, Jamie, I'm, I'm going to pivot back to one of our other panelists, but, you know, our, our previous secretary of HHS promised us that uh, fax, fax machines would be retired in 2020. We're, we're, we're now in the middle of 2021. I, I'm still being told by doctors, um, well, I'll fax this over to you. Uh, it's been years since I had a fax. Can you email it? No, I can't email. So, you know, obviously our system, our intent, our intent is one thing, our system is another. Um, all of you have talked about mindset and behavior. Somehow or another, the mindset is there and the behavior is not. Um, and that's a real problem. So I, I, I'm wondering um, if I could just swing back. Sadika, do you have any thoughts about that? You're sitting on 70 million patient records. Amir touched on something which I've seen before. You know, who owns my data? Who owns my 70 million records in essence? In each country, it's different. To Jessica, Jessica's point, the airlines have agreements, the credit cards have agreements, and yet who owns your data? It differs from country to country. I mean, do you have any reflection on that? Yeah, I'll go back to one of the six points that I was making, Bill. And one of those is encouraging more data access, right? So thinking about interoperability and access. And, and there are several forcing functions surrounding our healthcare ecosystem that have um, been enacted in the recent months and in, in recent year, right? The first one is, is good news. There, there is no further delay in effectiveness of information blocking as regulation that has started now. And kudos to Mickey and Steven at ONC for this major milestone. I think the most immediate impact we will see from this is uptick of requests for data sharing. So we, we do have an opportunity to get more data today yeah. than it so was gonna, a month ago. So stay with that. I'm gonna go back to Michelle um, for just a second. Um, you know, Michelle, you, you and Park Cell are opening up clinical trials all around the world. And obviously part of your responsibility is to make sure people participate in those trials. It's not just trial design. I know you're intimately involved in study design and you're looking at the operations of the study. I imagine one of the aspects of the operations of the study is let's get people to participate in this study. Uh, the data show that the more serious the illness, the more willing the people are to sort of like, forget about my privacy, I want into this trial. You know, my life is, my, my, I've got this sarcoma, get me into this trial as quickly as you can. Okay. So we're dealing also with the personalities of disease. I, I, I want to sort of take this flow and bring it down to the individual. When you're looking at data governance or who owns what, or what are we going to do with it? Um, or how do we engage people in the interoperability of the data? C could you bring us into the thinking of your great organization of a, sort of the conversation you'd have around the virtual boardroom around a trial and data governance. Right, so um, a lot of what we talk about right now, Gil, is the importance of understanding a patient's journey through their disease and their interactions with various treatment modalities. And what that looks like to us is, you know, who am I, Gil Bash, before I'm enrolled in the study? Who am I, Gil Bash, when I'm in the study? And who am I, Gil Bash, once I'm done with the clinical trial or the study? Um, so, you know, we really would benefit in, um, you know, not only um, developing therapies faster and at a lower cost, quite candidly and getting them to the hands of patients that need them, but also, you know, that convergence between us as a life science company and Jess's company and, and Jamie's company is health technologies and Sadiq is, um, you know, integrated 
uh, healthcare provider network, we would really benefit from being able to have that longitudinal view of, of patients of Gil and, and Michelle and Jess and Sadiqa, um, you know, through throughout our lives, right? And that's not that's not the same thing per se as um, some of these cradle to grave data assets that we see, for instance, in Costa Rica, or, you know, Estonia and um, the Nordics. This is really um, yeah. about patients engaging kind of with their data and bringing it from care provision to study back to care provision, right? Um, I, you know, yeah, this, is, this is, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. You're talking about enrollment. Yeah, patient enrollment in studies is one of the most, you know, critical, uh, obviously critical um, indicators of a, of a study success. And yet it's the thing that is in our least control. And um, unless, unless we can do a better job really creating that seamlessness for patients and creating more value. And by the way, once they're done participating in the study and spending all that extra time at clinics and giving their data over to the evaluation of that therapy, let's not drop them like a, you know, a hot potato back into their, their, you know, healthcare provider. Let's, let's let them have, you know, portability of that data and let that experience inform what happens next for them. That's, you know, you're that's talking really about better. something that, that Amir touched on earlier, Michelle, that I think is so important. You know, we're, we're talking about data governance or data mm -hmm. and what Amir and you have just sort of pinpointed is we're talking about people. That's right. So when we conceptualize what Sadika was talking about, which was 70 million records, we're really talking about 70 million people um, who, who, to your point, have 70 million different um, needs, expectations, aspirations. So I want to I want to flip back to uh, Amir for just a moment on this because I think that the, the three of you have so aligned right now um, around these topics. You know, Amir, you and I travel the world. We travel the world extensively. Um, I often am in countries that have closed loop health systems, cradle to grave systems. People have access to their data. And I, I go to lecture on the US health system, our fragmented health ecosystem. And they look at me like I'm, I'm, um, I'm talking about some sort of science fiction novel. Actually, some of them find it hard to believe that this nation has this health system. Uh, they, they're like, they, they think I'm kidding them. Um, I, I'd be curious to get your perspective because you also can compare health system to health system as you sort of navigate the world. Um, why is it that we're stuck with the facts? Why is it that I cannot go in the same town to two different doctors who are affiliated with two different systems and they can't really communicate with each other? It, it, it's certainly not innovation or technology as, as Jamie pointed out. That's, that's simply not our problem. It's something else. What is our problem? So a couple of things, first of all, I think Although the U.S. healthcare system may seem strange to anyone else, it is not surprising that where where we are within the context of the economic system of the U.S. Right, and I don't think it's just an industry problem. I mean, if you, it's all about incentives, right? So, as an example, I think most of us may remember the day that the New England Journal of Medicine, their editor had the editorial where he called data scientists who were asking to have access to data as data parasites. Do you remember that? He yes, literally called them data parasites. And his point was, hey, we the academics who spent all this time and applied for grants and did the hard work and generated the data. And now you just want to turn up and just take our data and do whatever with it. And really not thinking about kind of the positive outcomes of that. So I think it's not just an industry problem. It's a sort of industrial academic problem in terms of incentives for data. In terms of what's really kind of the challenges with US healthcare, I don't think, I think everyone, including our audience, probably has a good sense of what that is, right? That's more to do with politics and incentives. Uh, but I think that what we have to think about really is whether it's financial incentives on the healthcare delivery side or whether it's incentives on the data generation side, you know, how do we incentivize and align those with patient uh, alignment, basically? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, take a piece as we move forward. I, I wanna bring Jessica into the conversation with us, but the, um, 
clearly are um, all the major health systems of the world were created post-World War II. And, and, and so that sort of like some countries created um, what we'll call national health systems. We created a entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, system, you know, based upon different economic pockets. Uh, I think what we're hearing, if I understand you correctly, is our, our system is, is centered around the economics of health delivery. Um, and Amir, I've often heard you speak at podiums about patient centricity, you know, it, it's not inviting the patient to the table, it's their table. Um, and so I wanna get Jessica into this conversation now because I've always felt that um, I've been a big believer, I've written about this, um, that digital health would be the glue that would start to piece together this fragmented system. And in the context of data governance, it was my hope that it would give um, people we're always people first and patients second, but people, it would give us more voice within the system. We would start to actually have data that we could sort of contribute or control. I mean, what, what role do you think digital health is going to play in two, two part question, get ready, the, the theme of, the, of our panel, data governance, and two, the voice of the patient at the table of health innovation. A great question. I, th I think you're right. Uh, digital health technologies are the glue because they can bridge across research and care. They can connect everything together in a cost efficient, um, interoperable way that enables that real time access. So it's, you know, when going back to the credit card example, if you use it in another country, you get the text, was this you? Um, and it's all integrated and it doesn't matter what country you're in, standards have been accepted and, and systems have been accepted. Um, so the, the role of digital technologies, you know, just looking at where I'm at now at Huma, we have national deployments delivering hospital at home care across countries, countries. So, you know, we went live in a hundred clinics in Germany in one day you know, that type of scale and speed doesn't happen unless you have a really accessible, cost-effective, smart technology that's easy to use, easy to implement, easy to scale. Because we don't get to progress by everybody being really innovative. We get to progress when we get to standardization. And that standard standardization is what enables us to really achieve better, greater, different, instead of just doing a new little thing here, a new little silo there. If we harmonize and standardize, that, that, that governance is what unlocks the value. And you ask about patient voice. Well, yes. the nice thing about data ownership, data ownership is not binary. It's not like a car. It's either my car or your car. Data ownership is not binary there can be multiple owners. And so when you think about data ownership, think more about clean air or clean water. There is a shared collective responsibility and there is a shared benefit and there are multiple owners. And so we need to reframe how we're starting the discussion so that we can continue to bridge and develop you know, what we're doing at Huma Hospital at Home Technology across lots of different countries, clinical trials across lots of different countries and do it really quickly and accessibly because there's mm -hmm. no reason in 2021, we shouldn't be able to do it. I'm also an appropriate analogy for Earth Day. So thank yes, you for that. Yes, exactly. You know, I, 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 struggle, I struggle with the fact that somehow or another, some people think that, um, that, um, that we, we pay too much attention to this planet that we share and that you know the, the, the air over Paris has nothing to do with the air over Paris, uh, Paris Texas. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to explore that in another webinar that the, uh, the Gallion Foundation will host with, um, with Bill Gates. So, uh, you know, Jamie, right now, just a few seconds ago, we, we, we heard, we heard um, something very poignant and, you know, I'm just sort of reflecting on the fact of standardization. And you mentioned earlier, you're the sort of guy I feel I can put on the spot. I don't know why. You just have that edgy <laughs> look. Um, but we'll see if you're right. Uh, <laughs> you'll be okay. Don't worry. Um, so Jessica was talking about standardization. Um, you know, and, and it's true. You know, sort of like m big systems create some sense of comfort and um, conformity. And you're working across many systems, many, many systems. 
you you are the you're the um, shall I say the you're the glue that's holding the diversity together. Um, I'd be just curious when you're sitting down again. Don't share proprietary information. But when you're moving from system to system to system, you have best practices, best learnings. How, how do you convince people to say, you know, folks, when it comes to use of information and, and engaging people with health concerns, we, we've got to abide by a certain set of standards. How, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, we do it through our implementation process and we have a very rigorous one where we will actually walk people through step by step what needs to happen. I think the interesting thing, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get a lot of head nods here, in working with health systems and working with their EMR platforms, once you've seen one instance of Epic, you've seen one instance of Epic. Yeah. Different data structures, even within the same company, different workflows set up amongst health systems, each one being what they would consider proprietary because it's how they do business. Um, so from our standpoint, it's about coming up with that normalization layer that then you can translate that data into to make it universally usable on our side. Um, and it takes a lot of discipline. It, a lot of times it's a brute force field mapping exercise that you end up having to do. Um, and that's why companies like Redox and other companies like that exist because they've built these interfaces and can help assimilate um, all of this data that's in different formats into a single format. And I think what it really needs, Gil, is a lot of leadership and what I would call political conviction. I mean, what we saw, and I think Jessica had a number of great points here in terms of data being responsibility and then moving towards standards. A few mic drop moments for her, I think, in this session. Um, because fire and all these other standards that are out there, like it should be easy for us to get data from one place to another and it's still not. And none of it has to do with the technology. Um, if you take a look at telehealth adoption during COVID, it's not like some new holographic tel telemedicine technology that came up that made it easier for everybody to use. We're just using the tried and true technologies that were already out there with email, chat, video, whatever it might be. And I think the same can be applied to data. This is not rocket science. It is us all pulling together, locking arms and saying, you know what, we've had enough. It's now time for us to all do this in a standardized way. And then just like meaningful use drove the adoption of medical records, uh, electronic medical records, having that same type of conviction around data. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, in, just as an aside, in this house, there's telehealth going on right now. I, I'm forbidden to go into the second floor of the house. It's like locked off. It is a, it's a HIPAA secure environment. There are sound machines going on. The door is locked. Um, you know, I, I think that clinicians take it very, very seriously. I, I, I really do, to your point. You know, I, I want to go back to Michelle for a second. And uh, Michelle, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to ask you to sort of open up the door a little bit of the, the, the magic box and, and share with us. You're, you're getting a lot of data. You know, you're sourcing a tremendous amount of data. Your, your mission is to help enterprises, physicians, patients with serious or, uh, or, or really quality of life serious illnesses. And you've got to assemble data. We're in a period now, as Jamie just said, with you know, the use of telehealth and other modalities where suddenly we're, we're reaching out to people who never before participated in clinical trials. You know, Amir, I'm sure we'll have something to add to this. We're looking at the, the future of decentralized trials where new populations are getting involved, new data is being collected from new regions of the nation of the world. And I'm just curious, when you look at data governance and you look at um, access to data, it, it is, it is it, having these new people come into the uh, drug innovation process good, bad, problematic, new challenge, new hurdles? How do you define it? Welcome. It's welcome. Um, you know, improving you know, the quality of the care and the therapies is, um, you know, is an all comers kind of paradigm, Gil. So the more, the better in, you know, it, there's a, there's kind of a healthy conversation that, that is going on about um, the order in which we uh, define patient populations and we study drugs. Um, so we begin with very, very controlled populations. All the patients need a certain um, well-defined profile. And then 
as the the compound or device moves um, through through the the clinical development life cycle, and we we know a little bit more about its safety, and we know a little bit more about its efficacy. We loosen the controls, and we let the population look a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more like the the way that. Um, patients in the prescribing environment will be treated, right? Um, such that when we come now in regulatory bodies, you know, approve the, the compound for uh, marketing, it then goes out into the, in the real world, the messy real world, right? And it's, you know, physicians and clinicians are using it in all kinds of ways, right? Um, they're, the healthy debate is we begin the other way around. Let's start with the mm -hmm. messy real world, right? And then start to narrow down the patient populations to understand the behaviors, right? So when I say welcome yeah. and all comers, um, what's best for us is to understand the impact of therapies, you know, across the broadest array of um, patients that we can or treated population. Thank you for that. Can. Thank you for that. And I also want to acknowledge you and Par Excel. I know that you are. Uh, in the forefront of the conversation on decentralized clinical trials, yeah. that when you say welcome, it's not just a, um, it's just not a, a gracious word. You are, you're also rolling up your sleeves to make that possible. So congratulations to you and, and to Par Excel. So, you know, Sadika, I, I, a question I have is the balance, the balance between, um, that we, we're asking ourselves right now between data ownership and data access. You, you, these millions of, of patient records you have, um, you know, obviously you're, you're sitting on this, you're guarding it, there's, there's policies in place, governance of the data. Um, when, you, when you look at ownership and access, are they, are they two different pillars of thought within the system? Do you merge them together? Um, you know, who are you giving the access to the data? Obviously blinded data but who are you giving access to these data? And, and also at the core, who owns these data? Yeah, I, to your question, Gil, those are two separate things, ownership versus access. The ownership is a question that I think our US healthcare system is still trying to answer. And we face that in our data set as well. Right? If you ask a health system contributing the data, they would say they own the data. Whereas if you ask a patient going to that health system, they would want to own their data. That question is still unanswered. The, then the question becomes who accesses the data and through what provisions, right? And today the provision is HIPAA and HIPAA has de-identification and aggregation of data. And utilization of both of those is important for us to disseminate the data for patient care, for benchmarking in patient care, for cost efficiency, for drug development, you name it. When it comes to data access, we have to be the stewards of data for the patient. And I'll go back to the passion for patient and patient care. If we keep that principle at the center of it, data access questions become easier. And we ask ourselves every time we get a request, how does this serve patient care? And will our patient, if they learn about this, will our patients want to provide access to that data? And do we have the consent from those patients to provide access to that data? That's a very good inflection point. You know, um, you know moving over to Amir for a moment. I know Amir on the stage of CNS Summit, you, you've had many, many leaders of, of the system you know, step up. And, you know, you've interviewed them and you've established a close connection. Again, without divulging any unique conversations, you know, to Sadika's point, th this concept of the difference between um, ownership and access, um, there's a lot of confusion. You, know, you, you, you were born in one country, raised in another, came to another, uh, practice medicine in Australia and then came to the United States. Amir truly is a globalist. He, he has to remember what passport to pull out of the drawer when he goes to the airport um, because he's such a, he's such a, he's a world citizen. But, but with a world being a world citizen, you have a responsibility also to appreciate systems. So 
I'm going to ask you to sort of like be the visionary that you are. And if you were to say next step, next step in terms of data governance, ownership or access, here, here's my words of wisdom, you know, for, for, the, uh, for our, our newest secretary of health, you know, focus on, focus on this, please. What would you advise? So actually, I will take my wisdom from some of the questions that have come in from our great audience. So let me pull two of those to answer your question, okay? The first one is, uh, someone asked about the role of patient communities. So as we look forward, I think the traditional, I'm going to focus on drug development for a minute, the traditional way where it's been pharma companies actually developing drugs, that's going to continue. However, apart from the new biotechs, I think we're already seeing many patient communities raising funds, doing their own development really independently, and re especially in rare diseases to start with. So I think one thing about the future is I think someone asked about role of patient communities, not is it only critical for everything we do, but I think more and more patient communities will take the control into their own hands of really trying to push forward uh, treatments that matter to them. Secondly, someone else brought up a really good question around how do we build and maintain trust? which I think my conversations previously with Michelle, I know she's kind of thinks about a lot. And I think uh, the questioner actually mentioned some entities, which frankly, some of them were initially presented as patient driven communities and have now sold to for profit entities and the patients who gave their data to those now find themselves suddenly, you know, with their data owned by people they didn't think was going to be owned or licensed to pharma they didn't expect when they came in. So I think we have to be very careful how we're very good at monetizing everything in the US. But how, what is that tension with really people trusting that if I give my data, how do I know, you know, in the future that ownership won't change? And I see Michelle and Jamie nodding. I'd love to hear their comments about it. But that's what I would say. Thank you, Amir. That's, I think, excellent. I, you know, I also, I think, you know, Jamie, for instance, mentioned Stacy Hurt a, a few moments ago. And, and for people who know Stacy, you know, she's, she's quite a, a patient advocate dynamo. Um, she's not only a stage four colon cancer survivor, she's actually caring for uh, a child who was born with a chromosomal abnormality. Um, and uh, she struggles with getting the system to, to understand her situation. Um, I, I highly recommend people on this call follow Stacy Hurt to really understand that N of one, the multitude of many. So I do think of that. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering, Amir, and I, I, I want to pivot over to uh, Jessica on this question because I think she lives in the nexus of all of this. The, we talk about being more responsive to patients. But for some reason, and I think emotionally and intellectually, we get it. Um, but what will it take to push the system to actually do it? So our good intent and our good words on this call, I think are welcomed. I'm seeing in some of the comments, people are saying fantastic, but how do we really make it fantastic? And, and, and I think Jessica, you you look at technology and innovation as a, as a tool of bringing more people into the conversation. What, what's your advice of trying to make what Amir just said possible? Well, it goes back to the title of the session. It's governance. Until we have national governance or global governance that gets us to the place of airlines or credit cards, we should go with our institutional governance. You know, pharma companies should put in their own governance practices that says we will not develop a protocol or a questionnaire without getting input from patients early on. Um, I, I know Paraxel is doing this. We do this at Huma. Before we do a study, we sit down and we watch the exact patient who is, who, how do they go through it? How do they click the box? How far do they scroll? What is their experience? And, and if we put that into our governance, that becomes the norm that becomes the status quo. And, and right now we're still at the point where it's something exceptional. It's still something you have to remind people to do. It's still something not done all the time. We need to put it into the governance. I love that. And, and the governance will get us that, that baseline. I, I, I absolutely love that. Just by the way, as a policy statement that I share this with our panelists who also get an opportunity to speak often, I've made it a policy, uh, a personal policy when I'm invited to speak on the patient experience I don't speak unless there's a patient on the panel. 
And, uh, and, and everybody, I see Jamie nodding, Amir nodding. I, I'm asked actually on a weekly basis to speak on a panel that somehow or another titled the patient experience and there's no patient on the panel. And I say, I, I'm happy to speak, got to get a patient, and I, I make some recommendations. So I think, Jessica, you're, you're, you're right about this sense of institutional governance. And I think it's not just our industry or the, I'll call it the innovation industry that many of us are from. I actually do think it's the major uh, professional and uh, professional associations. I, I won't mention them here, but actually the, the most recent one was a major group, global group that deals with economics, health economics. I was asked to be on a panel about patients, no patients. So, um, you know, I think that as leaders, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And I think you've made an excellent point. You know, you know Jamie, I, I know that you're, you, you and I are both close to people like Stacy. And, um, you know, here you're running this corporation and it's dealing with countless medical systems. You're putting in place procedures. Um, and, and you're talking about a patient. And, and, and obviously to what Amir said and Jessica said to all of our panelists, we're, we're, we're trying to bring it down to the one, right? Each one of us is a person and potentially we'll all be patients. What, what, forget about your role as CEO of CloudBreak. I, I just, just talk about your perspective as a leader of our industry. Why is it important that we actually ensure that patient voice is represented as we think through um, what one of our one of our attendees has asked: access and ownership. Why do we have to think about the patient? Yeah, I mean, look, I would love to live in a world, Gil, where we say the patient owns the data and everyone else just gets access to it to document what they need in that patient record, right? And then the patient can choose what they want to have done with that data. They can influence the data, etc. When it comes to ownership versus access, you know, we've done it in the financial world. You know, Sadiq has spoken about this, Jess has spoken about this. Um, if you take a look at your credit score, right? Like you have access to that credit score. You don't own that data per se, but you can certainly influence it, challenge it. And there's a methodology over which you could control it. Um, when it comes to healthcare, nothing like that really exists. You can't change something that's in your patient record. You don't have any control over it, let alone getting access to it and getting it to someone else who might need to see it so they can treat you from a longitudinal patient, longitudinal patient care standpoint. Um, I know at CloudBreak, you know, and I've learned this from Stacy um, and from Jen Horn, Jeff and other kind of patient advocates out there. Like <laughs> one of the things that we say in our core values is that we are all patients. And I think that's something that is easy to forget when you're running a business. Like not all, not all of us are doctors and not all of us get to treat patients. Um, some of us are caregivers Right, but we're all patients at one point or another in this life cycle. And we need to connect with that more from a product standpoint. Um, and so we, when we're designing things at CloudBreak, it's a, it's, it's a big focus of you know, taking a design thinking methodology and interviewing patients and interviewing providers and figuring out what we would really want from the experience as opposed to just developing a technology to solve a problem. None of this lives in a vacuum, especially in healthcare. So you know, that, that's, that's our point of view. That's a great, great, in, in a way, the summary of the sentiment of all of our panelists today. You know, first, uh, Jamie and Jessica, Sadika, Amir, Michelle, everybody, I, I cannot thank you enough for being part of this conversation. As you know, it's recorded, it's going to be shared. I have a sense because of the import of your words, thousands and thousands of people will see this. I will be thinking about my credit card and my next flight, Jessica, um, and thanking God thanking God that there's not competing interests as uh, occasionally all of us have been on a plane that's attempting to land. Amir has probably experienced this countless times and it shot up in the air because it got too close to, uh, to another airplane. Some nods going on there. I, I, I see Salika breaking out into a cold sweat. Um, but <laughs> we have to remember, we have to remember that um, what we've heard today are, are, are very wise words, counsel, some of them are aspirational, some of them very practical. I wanna thank you so very much for sending us in the right direction. I wanna to return to our host, the Gallion Foundation. We took a poll at the very beginning. Um, it, it was actually the question I would have asked each of you. I, I'd be curious in one word before we go to the poll very quickly, if you looked at the poll in one word, what's keeping you up at night? Michelle, what's keeping you up at night regarding data governance? Honestly, it's that um, 
our one position. Oh, policy. Policy. Okay, Sadika, one word. Policy. Policy. Amir, one word. Culture. Culture. Jessica, one word. Money. Money. Jamie? Behavior. Behavior. Wow. Take those, take those five words. You got a plan of action. With that, if I could ask our Gallion Foundation staff to share with us what were the poll results, please. There we go. Concerns about cybersecurity and, 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 and uh, um, sort of rank, but I'll tell you, this is, um, this is a difficult poll because I think any one of these could have been the number one thing. I'm gonna take what the one word that the five of you said though, um, as my watchwords when we deal with data governance. I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank the Gallion Foundation and the staff who put this together. And I wanna thank our hundreds of participants today for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Let's remember what the key point was. It's all about the patient. It's all about people. That's why we're doing this. It's all about people's lives and improving people's lives and improving society. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Stay healthy. Wonderful to be with you all. Thank you, everybody.